searching for evidence at a home in Blackstone, Massachusetts at this hour after the remains of three babies were found in the home yesterday. In Connecticut, firefighters battled a massive fire at a perfume factory last night as they dealt with intense heat and explosions. A convicted killer of three high school students in Chardon, Ohio, has been recaptured after he escaped from prison last night. In a moment, we'll bring you details on those news items and the, the rest of the day's news this Friday morning, September the 12th. Right now, though, welcome to the land of the barely awake, if you're just now joining us in it. Thank you, Molly. It's 6.32 in the morning. Just a few hours ago in South Africa, a judge found former Olympian Oscar Pistorius guilty of the lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter. Yesterday, that judge cleared the 27-year-old Pistorius of murder and premeditated murder charges. She said the state failed to prove that he intended to kill his girlfriend, model Reva Steenkamp. The judge also found Pistorius guilty of a weapons charge involving a shooting at a restaurant, but he was found not guilty of shooting a gun through a car sunroof and illegal possession of ammunition at his house. Under the South African judicial system, it's not over yet. It could take weeks for him to be sentenced. He faces up to 15 years in prison. Our other top story this morning is out of Blackstone, Massachusetts. That's where a gruesome discovery was made at a house that's been described as a house of squalor. The bodies of three infants were discovered in the home late yesterday by detectives and hazmat crews. Susie Steimel is on the scene this morning with today's developments. Susie? Well, Frank and Barbara, police, as you can see, are still outside the home here in Blackstone, Massachusetts. And the house outside of the door says it all. There's red tape on the door letting people know that this place has been condemned after the bodies of three infants were found inside this home. It all started about two weeks ago when one of the four kids living inside this home ran to a neighbor's house for help. The neighbor called police and when police showed up, they found a six month old kid covered in feces living in deplorable conditions. The house had mice, rats, bugs, flies and heaps of dirty diapers several feet high around the home. Police and hazmat that team set up tents outside of this home and wore head to toe protective gear as they came in and out of this house during their investigation. It was last night that police made that gruesome discovery of the three bodies of the infants inside this home. Autopsies should reveal more about what happened to these babies and the nature of their death. We have to ascertain who was in the house, who was living at the house, what was the time and cause of death. Who was, in the, who was in the house? When we ascertain the time of death, we, have, we don't know yet who was living in the house at the time of death. Police have yet to file homicide charges in regards to the deaths of those three infants, but we do know that 31-year-old Erica Murray is due in Uxbridge Court this morning. She's facing witness intimidation charges in regards to what happened inside this home. Live in Blackstone, Susie Steimel, NBC10 News. Police are investigating a fatal motorcycle crash that occurred in Cranston last night on Route 37 near Natick Avenue. Cranston police say the crash occurred between the motorcycle and another vehicle just before 10 o'clock last night. Police haven't released the victim's name. They're waiting to first notify the next of kin. In Connecticut, firefighters battled a huge fire at a perfume factory in Bridgeport last night. It is now under control. The fire was first reported just before 7 o'clock last night and was still burning hours later. Fire officials say the building houses a roofing company and a recycled perfume factory. Part of the building exploded at one point. Officials say that was due to a broken gas line. There were no serious injuries, but two firefighters were taken to a hospital for heat-related illness, heat illnesses. All the employees had left for the day. Uh, by the time that fire broke out. Nine nearby homes were evacuated as a precaution. Residents are staying at a nearby church and about 1,500 homes were left without power. That power was shut off as a precaution. Providence police are investigating after one person was shot in the leg late last night. The incident happened around 11 p.m. at 166 Camp Street. According to Providence Police Lieutenant Donnelly, one person was taken to Rhode Island Hospital. No word on that person's condition or whether anyone is in custody. The convicted killer of three students at a high school cafeteria in Chardon, Ohio, escaped from prison last night, but after a search, he is now back in custody. Police say 19-year-old T.J. Lane escaped, escaped from a prison in Lima, Ohio, after he scaled a fence with two other inmates. He was found about 100 yards away and was brought back to prison without incident. 
Lane pleaded guilty last year to shooting three students in February of 2012 at Chardon High School. He was given three life sentences. It appears Baltimore Ravens running back Ray Rice confessed to NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell two months ago after he assaulted his then fiance. ESPN's Outside the Lines reports that Rice told Goodell on June 16th that he punched his then fiance in the casino elevator. This information directly contradicts what Goodell has said. Earlier this week, the commissioner said he did not know what happened inside that elevator until he watched the TMZ Sports video Monday morning. The Associated Press has reported, though, that a copy of the elevator video was sent by a law enforcement official to an unnamed NFL executive last April. Time now, 23 minutes before 7 o'clock. In a moment, more about the experimental treatment a Massachusetts doctor received with the help of one of his colleagues. And we'll tell you how a new proposal for the Newport Grand could actually save jobs. And on how that funeral home in Providence that's been receiving so much publicity lately was receiving taxpayer dollars, even after it was shut down by health officials. Closed captioning on NBC10 is brought to you by Cardi's Furniture. Nairobi offers same-day mattress eye delivery seven days a week. each other at the uh, polling places, figuratively, of course. Yes. <laughs> we have uh, all the comprehensive election results in just a moment. All right, Molly, now let's uh, get to all the election results. Watch the bottom of your screen for the results of the General Assembly races and a lot of the other races in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. We'll begin by focusing uh, on uh, the race for governor in Rhode Island. That's right. In the race for Rhode Island governor, there was a clear winner in the Democratic Party. Gina Raimondo beat out the current mayor of Providence and a first-time candidate with one of the most well-known political names in the state. Here's NBC10's Katie Davis. Gina Raimondo taking the stage in Pawtucket as Rhode Island's Democratic nominee for governor. Thank you, Rhode Island. Thank you. The general treasurer pulled out ahead with a strong lead as votes poured in Tuesday night. And I will be the governor that gets Rhode Island back yeah. to work. Yeah. The campaign largely a three-way race between Raimondo, Angel Tavares, and Clay Powell, a crowded field that helped Raimondo prevail. I think there's a segment that obviously dislikes what she did about pension reform, but there's another segment that said, you know, this was a tough decision that had to be made. Raimondo's campaign has already spent $5 million on the primary, with the general election still almost two months away. I think she has to continue doing the things she's done in the primary. Talk about how we create more jobs for Rhode Island, improve the economy. Raimondo says jobs will continue to be her focus as she takes on Republican Alan Fung. We don't have to accept having the third worst economy in the country. I don't accept that. Do you accept that? Despite the millions spent on the primary campaign, turnout in Rhode Island was light. But experts say Raimondo's ground game was strong, getting voters to the polls to take a strong lead. Katie Davis, NBC10 News, Pawtucket. And last night, Cranston Mayor Alan Fung celebrated after a hard-fought battle on the Republican side for governor. Fung, who got the GOP's endorsement, received 55% of the vote. Fung told NBC10 reporter Brian Crandall that restoring the state's economy is what he will focus on. We've just been, you know, putting forth our message about turning the state around, making it more business friendly. Uh, people resonated with my $200 million tax reduction plan, streamlining regulation. They've seen the results in Cranston of what we can do. Fung also criticized his opponent, Ken Block's past support for President Barack Obama and Block's previous run for governor as a member of the Moderates Party. Raimondo's uh, two Democrat challengers made concession speeches last night. Here's what Clay Pell had to say. But I want to assure you that we are going to be here together, not only tonight, that the community that we have built will survive this campaign, that we will continue to stand up for the values that have brought us together, equal rights, equal pay for equal work, justice and opportunity, the simple chance to have a, an American dream in this state. 
Angel Tavares also made a concession speech. At one time during the campaign, he was considered the front runner, but he only got 29% of the vote to Raimondo's 42%. His concession speech came in late last night. I may not be the nominee, but I want all Rhode Islanders to know that our state is worth fighting for. Now, Alan Fung's Republican opponent, Ken Block, got about 45% of the vote compared to Fung's 55%. He gave his concession speech from East Greenwich last night. We did not receive the support of the majority of Republican primary voters today. But it doesn't mean that we just simply go home and stop caring. Because I'm looking out tonight at a large group of people who care. This simply means that Republican primary voters have a different set of priorities than those that our campaign has put forward and the voters have spoken. And of course, there was a fourth Democrat running for governor in the elections yesterday, and that's Todd Giroux. Now with the primaries behind us, the candidates are shifting their attention to the general election. And Susie Stemmel has a closer look at the Providence mayoral race and how it's set to change in the coming months. And she is outside of Providence City Hall this early hour. Hey, Susie. Good morning, Barbara and Frank. Well, three men are now vying for a seat inside Providence City Hall for the upcoming general election, and one of them is independent candidate Buddy Cianci. He's been laying low throughout the primary season, but today he's coming out with a press conference at 11 o'clock outside City Hall asking voters to give him his old job back. As you well know, Buddy Cianci was the mayor in Providence for 21 years. And as many of you likely remember, he was arrested and convicted of two felonies during his time as mayor. One of those was an assault conviction. The other was for a federal investigation into corruption inside City Hall. He did serve time for those crimes. He was in prison for four and a half years. When he was released from prison, he took a job as a talk show host at WPRO. That show is, of course, called The Mayor. He is credited with helping out Providence during his tenure for 21 years. As the mayor of Providence, he helped build the Providence Place Mall and secure the water fire celebration that Providence is so well known for. Cianci will face off in the general election against Republican Dan Harrop, a doctor, and Jorge Elorza, a law professor who won the Democratic primary last night. That's what this is about. It's not about personality. It's about vision and who's got the best ideas to move this city forward as we did years ago and made it one of the best cities in the United States. Well, I look forward to two months of strong campaigning. We're going to continue communicating our message directly to voters, and I'm hoping that it's going to resonate just the same as it has in the Democratic primary. And as long as we keep building the coalition that we're building, I'm confident it'll take us to victory. You may remember Democratic candidate Brett Smiley. He dropped out of the race before the primary election to throw his support behind Jorge Alorza's campaign simply because the two Democrats wanted to make sure that Buddy Cianci didn't win the upcoming general election. Live in Providence this morning, Susie Steimel, NBC10 News. Thank you, Susie. There were many other races around our area last night in Massachusetts and around Rhode Island. Now, let's take a look at some of those. In the U.S. House District 1 Democratic race in Rhode Island, David Cicilline came out on top with 63% of the vote. And in the Rhode Island U.S. House District 1, the Republican race, Cormac Lynch, 72% uh, of the vote. Warwick Mayor Scott Avedesian had an opponent in the Republican primary yesterday. He had, with 66% of the vote, he defeated the challenge from Stacia Petri. Cumberland's mayor's race, William Murray is the winner, 49% of the vote over... Uh, Manuel DaCosta and Daniel Alves. He will face Mark Dasdurian, a Republican, in November. And in the Massachusetts governor's race uh, on the Democratic side, it was Martha Coakley on top with 42% of the vote. Uh, she was going against Steve Grossman and Don Berwick. Charlie Baker on the Republican side, the winner in the race for governor in the primary over Mark Fisher, 74% to 26%. Lieutenant governor's race in Massachusetts, Democrat Stephen Kerrigan defeated his challengers with 51% of the vote. Attorney General's race in Massachusetts for the uh, Democrats, Maura Healy, 62% of the vote over Warren Tolman's 38%. And Democrat Deborah Goldberg won the Democrat primary for general treasurer in Massachusetts, 43% of the vote over her challengers Barry Feingold and Tom Conroy.
Nine-term incumbent Massachusetts Congressman John Tierney lost the 6th District primary to ex-Marine Seth Moulton. Tierney is the first incumbent Democrat to lose a Bay State primary since 1992. And in the U.S., uh, Massachusetts U.S. House District 9 on the Republican race, John T uh, Chapman, that was a close race, came out on top with 32% of the vote. One other race we should mention, former Massachusetts U.S. Senator Scott Brown won his primary in New Hampshire. He ran as a Republican for U.S. Senator in that state, so he'll face the Democrat incumbent. U.S. Senator Gene Shaheen in the general election in November. And we do have full results on all of the races in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. All you have to do is log on to turnattend.com for that information. 6.41 in the morning now, 19 minutes before 7 o'clock. There were some scary moments in New Jersey last night. Miss Rhode Island collapsed on stage during competition. We'll talk about that in a moment. And there's been yet another change in the case against a man who was arrested in a deadly crash from two years ago. A dangerous virus has been found in mosquitoes in Rhode Island. This story's coming up, too. Closed captioning on NBC10 is brought to you by Party Spreadshirt.